This channel is part of the History Hit Network. On December the 13th, 1937, the Imperial Japanese Army attacked and occupied Nanjing, the capital city of the Republic of China. It became one of the most notorious events of the 20th century, the Rape of Nanjing. They committed horrific atrocities there. Many thousands of civilian deaths, rapes of many, many women, looting, pillaging, burning, an army out of control, creating an absolutely devastating scene. This is war at its most awful. The horrors beyond our, our imagination. Most foreigners had fled, but a small group remained in a heroic effort to help the people of the city. The actions of the 27 foreign nationals who stayed behind um, absolutely shine out. They saved thousands of lives. The foreigners documented everything. They wrote diaries, letters, and articles, and took photographs and films that recorded in detail countless acts of atrocity. And crucially, they got the story out. At huge personal risk, they smuggled evidence out of the city. It's just hard to believe how brave some of these people were, and for me, especially my father, because he took this terrible chance. If he'd been discovered, he certainly would have been executed. And they took it to the highest powers possible. Their evidence ultimately helped convict the perpetrators. Killing began immediately by Japanese soldiers, each one seeming to have the power of life or death. This is their story. In September 2015, the Wilson family traveled thousands of miles from America to Nanjing in eastern China. They've come to investigate a family secret. The truth about their father, Dr. Robert Wilson. The Wilsons have come to their father's old house. Elizabeth was born in Nanjing in the summer of 1937, but with war imminent, her mother took her back to America soon after. Her father stayed on. My baby will be six months old in a few days, and I have only seen her for seven weeks of that time. Their parents' letters and diaries show the hardships they endured. We are both unhappy, and Bob just lives and dreams for the time when we can be together again. Dr. Robert Wilson had been one of the few foreigners remaining in Nanjing when the Japanese invaded. He'd witnessed terrible atrocities. But after returning home to America, he never mentioned it again. My father never talked about it. My mother didn't talk about it. It was only after he died that his children discovered what his life in China had really been like. After he had died and my mother decided to sell a house and moved, I went upstairs to the attic and there was a suitcase there that I'd never seen before. And I, it was locked. I had to pry it open. And I encountered a big stack of these letters. He'd written hundreds of letters, and they contained the shocking reality of his life in Nanjing. Today marks the sixth day of the modern Dante's Inferno, written in huge letters with blood and rape. I've never felt more shocked. One Japanese plane dived down on the hospital and let loose two 1,000-pound bombs intended for the main building. The hospital would have been wiped out if the bombs had hit the right target. 
But the letters were just the beginning. At the hospital where he worked, an even bigger surprise awaited. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Their father is revered as a hero. Despite the danger, he'd chosen to remain in Nanjing, and during the worst of the massacre, he was the only surgeon in the entire city. He'd saved thousands of lives. At the Drum Tower Hospital where he worked, the Wilsons watch real films of their father caring for victims. The true horror of the era is revealed. In 1937, China was trapped in all-out war with Japan. The city of Nanjing was on its knees. Houses, schools and hospitals had all been blown to pieces and dead bodies lay strewn across the streets. It was devastating and sad to know that my father had to go through that and see that. And I mean, be there for so long, a year and a half of just 24 hours a day. Whilst most foreign businessmen and missionaries had evacuated, a small group stayed in a heroic effort to help the people. They believed their status as Westerners would give them power to protect civilians from the Japanese soldiers. Foreigners generally tended to assume that they had a sort of immunity from China's battles, whoever was fighting. Uh, they had a great confidence in their passports or the, the apparent color of their, their, their skin. The remaining foreigners set up a safety zone in the center of the city to offer a safe haven for civilians. And they kept detailed records of the crimes that they witnessed. The Westerners kept meticulous notes, um, meticulous diaries, wrote extensive letters to their missions, to different embassies, as a method of documenting the atrocity. And I think it is because there were so many foreigners there that we have this vast amount of evidence about Japanese uh, brutality. One man in particular American miner Searle Bates made it his duty to collate evidence. As a Nanjing University history professor, he wrote copious notes detailing what happened and kept copies of many of the letters and diaries of fellow committee members. When the Japanese attacked Nanjing, American missionary priest John McGee, one of the safety zone committee members, started to film the horrifying scenes he saw around him. Risking his life, he secretly filmed Chinese women kneeling before Japanese soldiers as they beg for the lives of their sons and husbands. But their pleas fell on deaf ears. Thousands of men were taken by the Japanese army, bound with ropes, and carried to the bank of the Yangtze River or to various ponds, where they were murdered with machine guns, bayonets, rifles, and even hand grenades. McGee wrote in a letter home, The horror of the last week is beyond anything I have ever experienced. 
It's clearly a war crime by any standard you could possibly even think of. Troops are killing, looting, raping, murdering, all that is part of it. And you get these, I, you know, in some ways, I think these are the most horrific um, instances uh, where there is sort of competitive head chopping going on, where Japanese officers and soldiers use their uh, samurai swords uh, to decapitate. Another letter described corpses left lying in piles. They were all obviously civilians, hands bound behind backs, one with the top of his head cut completely off. Were they used for saber practice? What happened to them that made it possible for them to slaughter other human beings? Using the young soldiers to behead victims, where the victims are tied, their hands are tied, so they're not able to fight back. But the powerful sense of, of, of power that comes from being able to dominate another human being, even to kill another human being, is something that has to be learned. You can't just walk out and start killing people. People who are forced to do that break down. So soldiers have to be taught to be violent. And that's one of the things that was going on with this massacre. The Japanese army was a conscript army. These were mostly uh, rural men, farmers. Uh, in uniform, they were treated abysmally by their officers within a, a quite violent military culture. They were also imbued with a widespread racism towards Chinese uh, as well. They had no reason to think that their treatment of, of Chinese would be censured by their, their officers, and it wasn't. One of the issues with discipline was that these were essentially men who were a second or third reservist who didn't actually want to be there, and they weren't very particularly well trained. They had no military police around to kind of discipline them, and they run amok. Disarmed soldiers and civilian men were not the only targets. Around the city, Japanese army sought out women and girls and raped them. The rapes that took place in the aftermath of the Japanese occupation of Nanjing do stand as one of the worst cases that we know of, of an occupying army committing atrocities against a civilian population. But in this particular case, there was a purpose that served a racial end, you might say. It was part of a wider propaganda effort by Japan to show the Chinese that they were inferior would have to submit. The rape was violent and merciless. Teremoto Juhei took part in gang rape. Tamaki Matsuoka is a Japanese historian and activist who challenges Japanese perceptions of the war. In order to interview victims of the Nanjing massacre, she traveled over 90 times between the two countries. In 1988, she met Zhang Shouying, who 60 years on still relived the horror. <laughs> Coming out, me, not that dog. 
，但他心里头那个刀就没一刀，我就一划，那手不是走这个刀，挺热的，嗯，都看到这个了。The committee responsible for the Nanjing safety zone wrote almost daily complaint letters to the Japanese embassy. December 16th. In our agricultural economics compound, more than 30 women were raped last night by soldiers who came repeatedly and in large numbers. December 17th. Last night, soldiers repeatedly came to our library building with its great crowd of refugees demanding money, watches, and women at the point of the bayonet. Throughout the city last night, soldiers raped several women. December 18th, University Middle School. One frightened child killed by a bayonet, another critically wounded and about to die. Eight women raped. Neither the Japanese embassy nor the leader of the army, General Matsui, did anything to stop the misery. Using rape with young soldiers, encouraging them to rape women, is a way of training them to be violent. That's fairly safe. They're not in war with someone pointing a gun at them and they're shooting back. This is someone whom they have subdued, knocked out, being held down or tied down. So they can learn to be violent and be rewarded for that violence by their superiors in a fairly safe way. In a final estimate, 20,000 women and girls were raped during the first month of the occupation alone. 上官の場合は国際法ではそれ禁止されてるんですけどその国際法をまあ守らせるっていう意識ないそれからあとは日本のこの指導者も中国が後進国なんで国際法をえと破っても全然問題ないっていう意識をしっかり持ってましたからまあ大変大規模なあの女性に対するあの強姦それから臨姦ですねえそれあの性暴力がですから世界の残虐事件の中でもあれだけあの女性に対するあの暴力事件が起こったのは多分南京大虐殺事件がまあ一番の例だと思いますね。ジンリンコレージは、safety zone refugee camp for women and children。The missionary teacher in charge was Minnie Vortrin。She wrote about the rape victims seeking shelter there。Friday, December 17th, a stream of weary, wild-eyed women was coming in. They said that night had been one of horror, that again and again their homes had been visited by soldiers. Twelve-year-old girls up to 60-year-old women were raped, husbands forced to leave bedrooms, and pregnant wife at point of bayonet. At Jinling College, Vortrin provided shelter to over 10,000 women and children. Many of them rape victims who had fled their homes to seek protection in the safety zone. But many more never made it there at all. And for them, the situation was even worse. The reports that we have of civilian life in the rest of Nanjing, outside the safety zone, are absolutely horrific. Cases of soldiers entering houses, raping women, uh, killing civilians, people were essentially hiding hunkering down in the face of an army that was simply out of control. Their houses were being burned, the children were being raped. Uh, there was no food, there was no order. Uh, soldiers were completely uncontrolled. I don't think I can actually imagine the kinds of horror, that it, what, what it would do to anybody. Outside the city walls, unarmed farmers and peasants were murdered in their thousands. Two peaceful Chinese farmers killed by Japanese soldiers just for fun in a field outside Nanjing, January 1938. This farmer boy was killed by the butt of a rifle because he did not take off his hat. 
Wild animals and homeless dogs are now feeding on the corpses. This child was also deliberately shot. Its mother was wounded. Life itself seemed almost impossible. But a tiny oasis of hope existed in the grounds of a cement factory just 12 miles from the city. Jiangnan Cement Mill was run by the 26-year-old Danish adventurer Bernard Arp Sindberg. Sindberg had arrived in China a few years earlier and in 1937 found himself at the heart of the Battle of Shanghai. He was quickly employed by a British journalist for the Telegraph newspaper named Philip Pembroke Stevens, and together they covered the battle. But tragedy struck when they got mixed up in gunfire, and Stevens was killed. After the death of his friend, rather than return home, Sindberg made an even more daring move. He took a job a stone's throw from Nanjing. He was employed to safeguard the Jiangnan cement mill from the fighting and was paid 100 pounds a month for his trouble. His letter of acceptance still survives. I hereby agree to proceed voluntarily to work the Jiangnan cement works near Nanjing and to stay there during the period of hostilities entirely at my own risk without having any claims whatever on F.L. Smith & Co or any other party, in case I should be wounded, disabled, or killed. Reasonable hospital expenses accepted. Also working at the cement mill was German Karl Gunther. The pair quickly turned it into a refugee camp, offering shelter to factory workers and farmers from the surrounding area. Original film shows the camp crowded with refugees. Sindberg and Gunther draped large Danish and German flags all over the camp to protect it from Japanese air raids. In a letter printed in a Danish newspaper, he wrote, I asked people to help paint a 1,350 square inch Danish flag on the roof of the facility so that it could be clearly seen from the air. I guess this must be the largest Danish flag ever. Sindberg and Gunther attempted to care for as many of the local wounded as they could in their makeshift hospital. But when seriously injured refugees arrived at the camp, Sindberg would drive them through Japanese territory to the Drum Tower Hospital, each time putting his own life at risk. Delivered into the hands of Dr. Wilson, the lucky few would survive. But as the only surgeon in the city, even he was beginning to crack under the pressure. On the first day of the attack on the city, he performed 11 operations, but just four days later, the figure had jumped to 150 awaiting surgery. Wilson was often woken in the night to ward off Japanese soldiers who had sneaked into the hospital looking for women. He wrote in his diary, Three soldiers entered the hospital compound by the rear door and tramped up and down the hospital corridors. This was at approximately 8 p.m. At 9.15, my attention was called to the fact that a Japanese soldier was in the nurse's dormitory. I went there with a lantern and found one soldier in a room with six nurses. He was partially dressed, and I found that he had been in bed with three of the nurses before I arrived. All the nurses in the building were terrified beyond description. Dr. Wilson could barely cope and resorted to hormone injections to get through the day. John McGee filmed some of the worst cases arriving at the hospital. This included 19-year-old pregnant Li Ying. Dr. Wilson wrote about her injuries a young girl of 19 who was six and a half months pregnant was foolish enough to resist rape by two Japanese soldiers. She received 18 cuts about the face 
several on the legs, and a deep gash of the abdomen. Many years later, Li Xiaoying remembered the struggle. McGee's films record other crimes. Eleven members of this family, both young and old, were raped and killed by Japanese soldiers. Two children survived as they hid under an old sheet. This stretcher bearer was machine gunned. A bullet passed through his shoulder. This seven-year-old boy was bayoneted and later died. There were many failed beheadings. In a letter to his wife, McGee wrote, I have visited Japan a number of times. It is a beautiful country, and I thought the people charming. How to reconcile the Japan that I have seen and the savagery that I have seen here is a problem that I have not solved yet. In an effort to keep news of the massacre from getting out, the Japanese imposed strict controls. Journalism, film, and photography were forbidden. When the Japanese army took over, all the kind of reporting apparatuses broke down um, because no government officials were around, no journalists were around. Only journalists that were around were Japanese journalists, and they're not going to report really on the atrocity. <laughs> News of the massacre might not be received well by civilians in Japan. So when reports of the occupation emerged in Tokyo, it was characterized as a peaceful liberation of the city. Japanese film crews were even sent to Nanjing to make propaganda films supporting the myth. We are not fighting against these people. We are, in fact, warriors who liberate them. People's happy laughter can be heard everywhere. The atmosphere of rejuvenation is much in the air of Nanjang City. But the reality couldn't have been more different. James McCallum, an American missionary in Nanjing, saw the crew at work. Some newspaper men came to the entrance of a concentration camp and distributed cakes and apples and handed out a few coins to the refugees. And a moving picture was taken of this kind act. At the same time, a bunch of soldiers climbed over the back wall of the compound and raped a dozen or so of the women. There were no pictures taken out back. Priest John McGee was also caught out by a Japanese reporter. The reporter visited his church and took photos of his congregation. McGee believed it was a chance to alert the Japanese people to the horrors committed by their troops. But when the story was published, it carried the title Smiling Nanjing, and photos of his congregation were captioned, bathed in the sunshine of peace. As 1937 drew to a close, the morale of the safety zone committee reached a new low. In a letter to his wife, Wilson wrote, This year ends with deep depression and no hope at all for the coming new year for us. The only comforting thing is that the situation cannot get any worse. They have got to stop killing at some time. Maybe when there's just nobody for them to kill. The members of the Nanjing Safety Zone Committee knew they had to act. They had to alert the world. 
they hatched an ambitious plan to smuggle McGee's films out of Nanjing. George Fitch, the administrative director of the safety zone, quickly emerged as the right man for the job. The son of missionaries, Fitch was born in China in 1883. He grew up in the eastern city of Suzhou. He spent his childhood in the leafy lanes surrounding his father's church at 130 Yangyu Lane. Despite a brief spell at theological college in America, Fitch resumed residency in China in 1909. In 1936, he moved to Nanjing, where he lived at 7 Baotai Street and took up a post at the YMCA. When the safety zone was set up, Fitch was elected as the administrative director in charge of the procurement of food and medicine. Occasionally, he was allowed to travel on Japanese military trains to and fro between Nanjing and Shanghai. On the morning of January the 24th, 1938, Fitch took McGee's films and headed for the train station. But the Japanese guards, suspicious of all foreigners, stopped him. They searched his luggage. Finding nothing, they let him board. They had made a fatal mistake. They didn't do a body search. My father took about eight rolls of uh, undeveloped film, sewed them into the lining of his great coat, and then boarded a Japanese troop train to Shanghai. In the international settlement in Shanghai, Fitch had finally reached safety. He immediately went to the Eastman Kodak Company and made four copies of McGee's films, which he packaged up and sent to America. It's just hard to believe how brave some of these people were, and for me, especially my father, because he took this terrible chance. If he'd been discovered, he certainly would have been executed. He also sent his personal diaries, a haunting account of the massacre that had taken place. The account was published in the Reader's Digest in July 1938. I climbed over mountains of dead on December 13th to see smoking ruins along that wide and formerly impressive avenue of which all China had been proud. Charred bodies were everywhere, in places piled six and eight deep. At the gate, the smell of dead, a terrible smell I shall never forget, was almost overpowering. Looking back toward the city, the scene was a jumbled one of corpses, twisted automobile chassis, the still mouths of guns, thickly strewn shells and cartridges, and blood-soaked bundles and bedding. It was the first step in bringing to light the rape of Nanjing. His son, John Fitch, has tirelessly researched his family story, discovering his mother also worked to promote the cause. Fitch's wife, Geraldine, typed up the letters that she received from him and sent them to various magazines and newspapers to help raise awareness. She would make sure it was sent not only to other members of her family, but to friends and influential people as well. Here's what's going on in China. You should do your best to help the cause. She was very forward in marching into somebody's office and saying, do you know about this or can you help me with this? She made use of every contact she could to get the story out. From Shanghai, George Fitch returned to America and started a drive to alert the country to the terrifying situation in China. He had many, many requests from civic organizations, from various churches, YMCAs, and so forth, to come and lecture and talk about what was happening over there, and in most cases, I believe, to show this uh, horrible film. For months, Fitch crisscrossed his way around the country, giving speeches and showing McGee's films. 
One of his primary aims was to convince the government to stop selling war materials to Japan. In Washington, D.C., Fitch screened the films to the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Office of War Information, and scores of journalists. He even visited the White House to try and persuade President Roosevelt. In a letter to the president, he wrote, Please picture to yourself a hundred of America's fairest cities and hundreds more of her towns and villages laid waste by enemy bombers and countless thousands of her civilians, women and children, as well as men, slaughtered in cold blood. Please add to that the consciousness that a country you had considered a friend was continuing to supply the enemy with most of the materials she required to carry out this destruction and murder. I think he felt that our government would, would somehow use its influence to stop the massacre. And in particular, trying to influence our government into not supplying the Japanese with raw material, which was, of course, they used then in, in the, the war machine. Allies in World War I, America had continued to trade with Japan during the 1930s. Because there is no declaration of war, and of course also because America goes through a, the Depression, which is still a terrible reality at this time, about 1937, America continues to trade with Japan. And one thing it doesn't do, which probably would have had an immediate effect, is stop oil, uh, the oil supplies to Japan. Desperate not to be drawn into another war, officials believed that if they stopped trading with Japan, they might attract Japanese aggression on themselves. But as news of the Nanjing massacre and Japanese expansionism spread, the mood began to change. From the late 1930s to the early 1940s, the United States became increasingly alarmed at Japanese behavior in Asia. As they saw Japanese encroachment increasing, they became more and more worried that this would lead to a destruction of American interests in East Asia. The government felt it had to act. Embargoes were announced that ultimately prevented the sale of aircraft and other war materials to Japan. The idea was that the Japanese essentially would be both economically uh, prevented from carrying out further aggression, but also morally would be shamed in the eyes of the world and forced to retreat. It was an enormous achievement, but the effort and the memories of the massacre eventually took their toll on Fitch. After a relentless lecture tour, his health began to suffer. I can remember, even as a boy, his going out in the evening to give a talk at some nearby town. And he had an episode of amnesia. He suddenly, as he couldn't remember where he lived or where he was. He was maybe so fatigued by not only the talks, but also by the memories of, of the atrocities in Nanjing, that he actually couldn't speak at one point. By the spring of 1938, the front line of the Sino-Japanese War had moved away from Nanjing. The occupying Japanese powers set up their own puppet administration in Nanjing and deemed it the reorganized national government of the Republic of China. The new government instilled more control over the city and their troops. Atrocities by Japanese soldiers finally lessened. Things started to calm down. Embassies started opening back up again. And this was because, um, in some ways, the frontline troops have been moved on, who took over Nanjing, moved on. So much more um, disciplined, regular troops were coming in. In a more stable Nanjing, the work of the Safety Zone Committee drew to a close, and other members of the committee began to leave. John Raba, chairman of the Safety Zone, returned to Germany. He took with him his diaries and personal records of the massacre. Like Fitch, he was determined to get help for Nanjing. 
Germany was now allied with Japan, but he wouldn't let that stand in his way. Back in Berlin, he went to see the German Defense Ministry and Foreign Ministry. In June 1938, he took his effort to the highest power in the land. He hoped Hitler would persuade the Japanese to stop the atrocities in China. His suggestion wasn't kindly received. A few days later, two Gestapo arrived at his front door. He was arrested and marched away. After a tense period in custody, he was released, but his journals and films were confiscated, and he was forbidden to make any more presentations on Nanjing. Raba and the victims he was fighting for were silenced. From Nanjing, priest John McGee returned home to be reunited with his family in Pittsburgh. Dr. Wilson joined the US Army. Building on his knowledge of battlefield injuries in Nanjing, he led a medical team for the duration of the war. Sindberg emigrated from Denmark to America and became the captain of a US naval ship. He saw out the war in the Pacific. Minnie Vortrin also made plans to leave, but before doing so, one more incredible event occurred. She was given a medal. Today, it is kept at Illinois State Museum. This is the Order of the Jade that was awarded to Minnie Vautrin for her efforts in protecting 10,000 women and children during the rape of Nanking. The highest honor possible for a civilian, she was awarded it in secret by representatives of the nationalist government. Minnie was the first ever woman to get it. Eventually, all members of the Nanjing Safety Committee were awarded the medals as a symbol of gratitude. The foreigners who stayed were brave men and women. It was potentially very dangerous for them to stay. And we know this also from their accounts of how they were treated at the time. They are justly revered in Nanjing for what they did. On May the 14th, 1940, Vautrin boarded a liner and left China after 28 years. In Asia, Japan continued to wage war. On December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked the American Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. The Americans finally entered the war. It took another four years of bloody global warfare to defeat the Japanese at a cost of millions of lives. But finally, on the 15th of August, 1945, the Japanese surrendered. The following year, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East was convened to try Japanese leaders for war crimes. Commonly known as the Tokyo Trials, they were largely modeled on the Nuremberg Trials in Germany. At the hearings, the panel of judges drew on the photos, letters, diaries, and films created by the Safety Committee as evidence. For China to make its case internationally, these sources are hugely important. They're important because these are foreign sources, and therefore no foreigner is allowed to doubt the truth about this. No foreigner, no Japanese, no, it is really happening. The minor Searle Bates papers, now kept at the Yale University Divinity Library, were relied upon heavily. Bates and other members of the committee, including George Fitch and Dr. Robert Wilson, traveled to Tokyo to give their testimony. And the court was shown McGee's films. When McGee took the stand, he described the horror he had seen. 
What was the action of the Japanese soldiers towards the civilian Chinese men? The killing began immediately in several ways often by individual Japanese soldiers uh, or up to 30 soldiers together going about, each one seeming to have the power of life or death. One woman told me that her husband's hands were tied in front of her and he was thrown into a pond and she was, they stayed there and wouldn't let her rescue him. He was drowned before her face. After a six-month trial, the court gave its final judgment. Seven of the 28 defendants were sentenced to death. Amongst them, General Iwane Matsui, the commander-in-chief of the Japanese army at Nanjing. He was executed at Sugamo Prison in Ikebukuro, Japan, on December the 23rd, 1948. The evidence provided by the Nanjing Safety Committee was key in convicting him. Its stark proof is impossible to deny. One of the most important things that the Safety Zone Committee did was to leave behind their own records of what happened. It provided a form of witness, and that third-party testimony is one of the most important sets of evidence that we have in reconstructing and understanding what had happened in Nanjing and why. The records are still important today, not, I think, simply to draw simplistic moral tales about black and white and good and bad. There are plenty of moral tales to be drawn from that material, but to understand something more about the dynamics of war, about how civilized, normal people can find themselves caught up in desperate situations. I think that the documents are important in that we remember and that there is a record and that it shouldn't be forgotten um, and that the war, the Second World War, wasn't one that um, encompassed Europe. It's not suffering just within Europe, but it's actually much more global war that um, much of East Asia suffered and in, in quite horrific ways. The documents, the eyewitness accounts, have to be preserved, restored, studied exactly so that, so that the record is, is there and, and can't be denied. If we don't understand that, then we really have no way to prevent it happening again. The achievement of the foreigners who remained in Nanjing in saving so many lives and documenting the truth will never be forgotten. The memorial to the massacre in Nanjing remembers those who died, but also honors those who helped others to live. For John Raba, after the end of World War II, Conditions deteriorated in a defeated Germany. 12 hours of daily manual labor in the Siemens factory brought him just meager rations of soup and bread. Life was hard. But all was not lost. In an astonishing twist of fate, he was saved by some of the very people he had helped in Nanjing. When news of his poverty reached the city, their reaction was swift. They raised $2,000 and also sent a monthly food package. Raba passed away just a few years later. But his story didn't end there. In 1996, the New York Times published excerpts of his diaries from Nanjing. Famed as the good Nazi, 
he finally received the recognition he deserved. For Minnie Vautrin, there was no such fairy tale. On arrival back in America, her life took a turn for the worse. Haunted by all she had witnessed, she sunk into a deep depression. She was so overwhelmed by the um, pressure and anxiety that she had experienced, and her grief, I think, too, the, uh, seeing so many people for whom she had tried to protect um, suffering. Uh, that grief was very deeply rooted in her, and she was not really able to recover from that. <laughs> In a letter to a friend, she wrote, No matter how hard I try not to think about it, my spirit seems to be marching towards collapse. She always felt like guilty because she didn't think she did enough, you know, and uh, because of all the people that died over there during that period of time. But, uh, you know, it was, I think that uh, she was quite a, quite a woman. Just one year after leaving China, she took her own life by turning on her gas oven. In her suicide note, Vautrin wrote, I have deeply loved and respected the cause of missions in Jinling College. Had I 10 perfect lives, I would give them all to the kingdom building. But alas, I have failed and injured the cause with the one life that has been mine. My remorse and regrets are deep and genuine. Sinberg retired to California, but the memories of Nanjing were never far away. His brother remembers their first discussion. It got late in the evening, and, um, and he just kept talking. I, frankly, at the time, thought that this is just crazy. This is just nonsense. Uh, how could anybody have a life like that? He showed me pictures, and uh, there are, you know, his stories about the mutilations and uh, um, rapes and murders and so on. It was just unbelievable. I found out, no, this was for real. George Fitch returned to China for the duration of the war and helped coordinate American aid. As soon as he could, he went back. It was just part of his DNA that he was destined to help other people. After the war, Dr. Wilson ran a hospital in California. He never spoke about the massacre again. Their journey of discovery has led his children to the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall. He didn't share with us because it was so horrendous. But now we know why he didn't share it with us, because it was too horrible. After a while, I don't think he wanted to remember. Not a lot of people can say that they had a hero of a father as I did. It's sad tears, but it's proud tears, and they just come. For the youth, it is important to learn their history and all, to see the memorial and see what has gone on in the past and how man can be so cruel to his other fellow humans, and we need to learn how not to go there again.